Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 12 of the Corcoran Cap, the podcast where we're talking A's, Niners, college stuff. And today we're starting off with the Golden State Warriors. I'm your host, Sam Corcoran. And Joel, I love Wardell Stephen Curry too. The Warriors are up 2-0. We've been killing the Nuggets. How are you feeling about everything? I feel absolutely fantastic. Uh, we're up 2-0 in dominant fashion, and I feel like... It couldn't, things could not have been going, things cannot have been going much better heading into game three. I don't know if that was correct grammar, but it feels very great. It does. No, it feels amazing going into game three. I said we were going to be 1 1 going into game three, but we're up 2 0. And Joel and I are just going to break down the games for you, kind of talk about what went well, what didn't go so well, what we need to work on. And I think. Overall, I definitely think you look at I looking at both of these games, I think the one thing that you and I talked about last week that the Warriors did best was lock up Nikola Jokic. Obviously, you know, I think game one was good for him. Obviously, he had he had 25 points game one. Tw- uh, game two, I think he was a bit under that. He had uh oh no, he had 26 game two. But anyways, he wasn't as efficient as you usually see a guy like Nikola Jokic being as efficient with. And I think a lot of that had to do with their defense. Not on Jokic, but around the guys that around Jokic's, Jokic's guys, he wasn't able to move the ball as well. Um, if I if I look at the stats real quick, how many turnovers did he had? Um, he had three game one, game two he had um, he had three game one, three game two. Uh, yeah. He got teed up twice game game two, got kicked out of the game minus twenty six for his plus minus game two, uh, minus nineteen. In game one, just overall, I mean, he, he shooting. What was the stat? It was like fifty-one points on forty-seven shots. That's not that great. I mean, they've been locking no. him up. No, we we've been playing him really, really, really well. Draymond specifically, he's been using him. In the bridge. I've noticed. I mean, Looney's doing his best. I'm not gonna give Looney. I mean, it's a really tough task to guard Jokic and. Looney picked up some early fouls uh, last, last game, one of which was, we were talking during the game, a little suspect. But, I mean, Jokic was bound to get some more calls. He only shot two free throws oh, in yeah. game one. I think he shot like eight or something in game two. Um, let me let me check that specifically. Uh, but, yeah, we've been guarding Jokic really well. I think overall on the series there was a stat where he scored like, uh, he scored 26-25. So that's 51 points, but it's been on like 45 shots. That's a huge win for the Warriors. The only the nightmare scenario for this series is Jokic averages like 34 every game and is uber efficient and is getting guys involved. Neither of those two things have been happening. By Jokic's standards, he has not gotten guys involved. He had four assists in game two on the early average, I believe, close to eight. And then last game, yeah. he had six. So holding the, the best passing center in the league and screw center – Holding one of the top three or four playmakers in the league to five assists a game while getting his own on a less efficient level. He's under 48% shooting so far in the series. During the regular season, he got shot close to 58%. This is – it could not be going much better. And what and the game plan's working well. We're conceding more shots to Aaron Gordon. We're giving Austin Rivers, Jeff Green, Jermichael Green, Will Barton. Even though Will Barton was going to get – Bones Highland. Will Barton was good in game one, but he was not good in game two. We got to concede mm-hmm. just more open looks and shots that c- capable NBA starters are much more c- capable of railing at a consistent rate. But as we identified, this Denver team is so depleted with two max guys out. They're playing bench guys in starting roles. And we're saying, here, Aaron Gordon, we'll give you open 20-footers. We'll give you open turnaround 12-footers. And Gordon has been a complete non-factor so far in this series. Jokic is the only one really doing anything. And I think it's just part of it goes to, I think, the intensity of defense that we've been playing with. All throughout game one, I feel like the defense is really intense. And then it took a little over a quarter, I think, to really get to that level in game two. But since that's halfway point of the second quarter, I feel like we really turned it up. Yeah, totally. And I think, I mean, as I said, they're they're kind of defending the guys around Jokic, so he can't move the ball as well. He turns it over more. He has to do a lot of stuff himself. That's why you see him taking the majority of the shots uh, during the game for Denver. So I, I think the Warriors' defense has been exceeding expectations, and so has the Warriors' offense. I mean, game. I, I, I think we can just start off with Jordan Poole. I mean, unbelievable oh, what he did. Unreal. <laughs> I mean, it's... He started he in his playoff debut as 
how old is this? He's 20 he's 20 something. He's 22 years old. He had 30 points in game one for context. That is tied for the second most points for a Warrior in his playoff debut in Warrior history. Number one is none other than Wilt Chamberlain. If you're on a graphic or a stat thing with Wilt Chamberlain, you are doing something right. Game two, oh, yeah. he followed it up with a, you know, 30. He, he had a slight letdown game, you could say, in game two. He had 29. He's been unbelievable in these first two games. He's just – there was a sequence where he hit two straight threes. I think you remember it. He had that shot. The confidence it takes to make some of these shots. He had one where he was on the right side, and he dribbled back along the baseline into a step back, like, one-legged corner three, and it was just all net. And I was like, holy cow. Like, there, he's playing with such high level of confidence right now, and it's unbelievable. Eight assists, yeah, two, I eight know. assists only two turnovers. That's great. Yeah, and then he's been so efficient for the Warriors. I think yes. – and especially, like, here's the thing, like, next season, and even this season, like, you're going to bench one of either Steph or Clay. Like, one of those guys is going to be a sixth man. Uh, Probably I Clay. I can play the three. With the, what's okay, then what do you do with Andrew happen? Wiggins? You trade him because you got to have to extend Jordan Poole. We need cap space. Mm. It's tough. It's tough. But Wiggins who's going to take on that contract, though, without – who who's going to take on oh, that contract, man. though? Wiggins is playing at a good enough level uh, where some team will take. You're telling me the Sacramento Kings wouldn't take him for a first round pick. You're telling me the Pacers wouldn't take him. You're telling me that you know it, Memphis. Memphis is looking to cash in. They run 15 men deep, but they don't necessarily have a bona fide third or fourth option. You're telling me that there are plenty of teams I think that would take Wiggins. Wiggins' you contract see- is still is still an overpay. But there's now it's not that much time left on it. I let me see Andrew Wiggins. I think. There's only let's check his contract. Um, similarity scores, salaries. His t- his contract only is two is two more years, and he's making an average of about thirty two million dollars over the years. Which don't get me wrong, is an overpay. But at this point in the NBA, if you're a starting caliber player, you're making between twenty to twenty five million dollars. Wiggins should be in that range. It's just a slight overpay. You see, here's my thing with that. And I think, for first of all, I just starting off with the basics, Andrew Wiggins is 27 years old still. He's about to go in the prime of his career. Klay Thompson is, I would say, past his prime. I think it's safe to say that Klay Thompson is past his prime. After the injuries, I think, I mean, he's obviously still a great player. But at the same time, I think you could see him shift to an Andre Iguodala role that he had with the Golden State Warriors when he came. He was past his prime at the time. He was trying to help this team out. I think that's the best place for Clay Thompson. On top of that, on top of that, I think Andrew Wiggins is the guy. Andrew Wiggins is what the Warriors wanted Harrison Barnes to be and what Steve Kerr wanted Harrison Barnes to be. And I think they're going to stick with that plan because you're not going to get another Kevin Durant. They wanted to stick with Barnes. They were going to stick with Harrison Barnes if they didn't get Kevin Durant. That's the thing. And I think they wanted to develop Harrison Barnes into that guy that Andrew Wiggins is right now. But they end up getting a chance to get Kevin Durant, and you're obviously going to take Kevin Durant over Harrison Barnes, Barnes or Andrew Wiggins. So I think that I think Andrew Wiggins is one of the best fits to this system. And I I think he's I think right now Andrew Wiggins' best place to play is Golden State. And I don't think there's a team out there that that would be a better fit for him. And that's why I think he's going to try to vouch to stay. I think that's why Steve Kerr is going to try to vouch to stay. Joe Lacob knows how to work the money. You, I think if anything, if anything, if you want to trade a guy on this team who has a big contract, you trade Draymond Green and give Kuminga minutes. No. You got to give Kuminga minutes at some point. And that's another thing about this playoff. Yeah, I mean, Dr- Draymond, you don't trade Draymond now. Draymond, okay, look, 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 look. Kaminga is, is 19 years old. You've got plenty of time to play Kaminga minutes. Next year, we're probably going to lose Otto Porter Jr. He's probably played himself into a better contract. He's playing on a minimum this year. He's just, he's just a rock-solid NBA man. He's going to get, you know, however much, eight, nine, ten million bucks to play for a good team next year. That minutes, those minutes are going to get filled by Kamega. Kamega is going to be playing over 20 minutes a game next year. Still coming off the bench, probably as our seventh or eighth man. Because you have to, so, and then at that point, he's 20 years old. Draymond, and you know, you know, we don't know how long Draymond's going to play, but it's safe to assume that within, what, five years, Draymond is either 
not on this team, out of the NBA, or just moved into, dip, into a different phase of his career. I don't know what that phase is. In five years, Kaminga is going to be 25. His minutes will constantly be going up. He may have moved into a starting spot within this lineup by now. We don't know. With injuries or some other guy getting traded or contract disputes, you never know. I think Kaminga is a high priority, but I don't think you pull the plug necessarily early. I think the guy you'd have to trade is Wiggins. The reason I think that is because Wiggins, I think we saw with that line, that last lineup with those five guys, Wiggins is the least essential. His main priorities are to slash and to or to slash and to play defense. I think that is the most replaceable factor. Jordan Poole, Andrew is Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. Threats having three lights out shooters on the perimeter, coupled with Draymond, who is the de facto five. You know, maybe you go into the into the year next year with another center. Maybe you get, maybe you bring back Looney or you insert Wiseman in the starting spot. Maybe the starting lineup is Steph Clay, Poole, Draymond, Wiseman. I just don't think you can bench Steph or Clay yet. Because obviously you're not going to bench Steph. Steph's still one of the five best players in the world. I don't think you're going to bench Clay. I mean, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, I mean, Poole, his game translates best to coming off the bench. But I think Poole is at a stage where he's proved so much in such a short amount of time that you just are going to feel gross if you don't get him the starting spot. So I think Wiggins is the, just the odd man out. And I, I love Wiggins. And I really would hate to see Wiggins go. But I think with the fact that we already are over the luxury tax by a pretty significant amount, Wiggins is making over 30 million bucks, and we have to extend Poole to likely a nine-figure contract. It's just he's the odd man out. That's that's how I see it. A nine-figure? I mean, I, I, mean, I think Mikhail, that, Mikhail that makes Bridges, sense. Mikhael Bridges got five years, 100 million. That, yeah, no, it's gonna be it's gonna be a nine figure contract. You're right, and I also just want to point out, but I want to get back to the playoffs. Just last thing, Andrew Wiggins, Jordan Poole are both under. Uh, sorry, Jordan Poole is a restricted free agent 2023. Andrew Andrew Wiggins is unrestricted 2023. So you have some time to make those decisions. True, that's true. the last thing I'm gonna say. Be, you don't have to be rash. You may maybe maybe pool is maybe you know maybe pool and the Warriors have an agreement. You never know. You never know. And I'm not you never know what's going on. I'm not saying this offseason that it's a necessity to trade anyone. I'm just saying that's the like that seem that's the roadmap that seems the likeliest to me deep down the line. Exactly. Matt, the matter is that the Warriors are in the playoffs. Jordan Poole, Andrew Wiggins yes. have been doing well for us. And another player that has been doing well for us that we have not talked about much is Steph Curry, obviously. I mean, yes. it, it coming off the bench, man. I mean, that's so weird to say see Steph Curry coming off the bench. But I mean, it's giving Poole those minutes, it's allowing Curry to rest up. And He's pro, he. I think game one. It, I think Joel. And I talked about this with my other friend too, uh, who I was watching the game with. And you could tell that his foot was hurting a little bit. Sixteen points. He was coming off short, sh- up short on a lot of his shots, in my opinion. But game two, game two is where he really stepped it up. And game two, he looked like one hundred percent. See, I don't even necessarily know if it was foot. I think you could just attribute it to the fact that he hadn't played NBA games in a month, and his game legs weren't literally under it. Maybe there was some foot discomfort. I mean, we don't know what exact percentage he's playing at. He looks pretty damn good last night. But I just think, yeah, I, I, I think it shows a lot about Steph's character. He doesn't care. He just wants to have an impact on the game, and he sees what's happening. Of Pools rolling. Let's get him as much minutes as possible. I'm going to – I mean, Steph being in the game is an automatic plus, even if he's not shooting, just his pure presence. So he knows as long as I'm out there, I'm going to be making a positive contribution. He played under 23 minutes last night. Funny enough, I saw this stat. He had 34 points in under 23 minutes. That's the only he's the only guy to do that in the shot clock era in NBA playoff history. Wow. Having 34 that's points under 23 minutes. That's crazy. That's ridiculous, man. I mean, yeah, he was just on fire. I mean, he made some ridiculous plays. I remember that and one oh, he had. Uh he had the, a three. And the three, he had that little turnaround bank shot off the glass. It was like, what? Oh <laughs> dude, that was amazing. That that was one of the most. That was one of I I said it last night. Steph Curry is the most ridiculous NBA player you will see in your lifetime. In your lifetime, he can make any shot that any he can make every shot that every NBA player can make plus more. Yeah, I mean he he. I mean we've seen it. I mean we've seen this man win two MVPs. We've seen this man lead the league in scoring. We've seen this man do everything pretty much possible. We've seen him win titles. We should have seen him win a finals MVP. Don't even get me started on that. Hey, hey, finals MVPs don't mean, like, anything. You won a championship. We know that Steph was the most valuable player on the Warriors team. 
it, at and the end of the day, they don't matter. Finals, in two finals, 2015 and 2018, I don't care. He was more valuable than Kevin Durant. He is better than him in three of the four. We're not even going to get started on that. But, I mean, Steph can do everything. And I think people, I mean, it, you've just seen it in the month with, it, with him and the month without him. I think it's you can look at it as a blessing in disguise and that Steph's likely going to have a little more juice, I think, for these playoffs than if he had been playing the remainder of the 82-game season, which is just a total grind. And in addition to that, Poole's come into his own. We've seen Poole get more minutes. I mean, Poole had that stretch of, like, 20, 25 straight games of 20 or more points. There's a chance Poole doesn't get that if that's playing, and there's a chance Poole's not on cloud nine that he is right now. I mean, I think it's just everything has come together so well and that we got all of our guys back, you know, minus Wiseman, but Wiseman's been out the whole year. We got all of our guys back. Poole's rolling. Clay's coming into his own. Clay had a kind of a slow start. He missed a couple shots that you think are automatic for him last night. But then he had that monster stretch where he hit two threes in a row. And he finished the game 21 points, you know, very solid outing. And, you know, he closed the year with three straight 30-point games. That's the first time in his career he's done that. Draymond looks – I mean, Draymond, you would have never guessed that Draymond had been hurt. Draymond is everywhere. Oh, yeah, he's, he's everywhere, everywhere, man. But I mean, Draymond yeah. oh. was in peak Draymond form in these two games. Oh, yeah, he's been phenomenal overall. I mean, overall, I think everyone's really coming together. You're seeing that strength in numbers – doing all that and the Warriors are up to a for a reason now final word Joel do you think the Warriors do you think the Warriors win the series and if so how many games uh, uh yeah I I think we are 17 and one in series after going up to one and if I'm not much mistaken that one series is a series where a certain someone was wrongfully suspended and our certain center got hurt and our certain best player was playing on a bad knee so I think that we do win the series I would say five games I feel like Jokic is going to have a game. I mean, it's up in Denver. They're going to get more calls. You know, that's just how yeah. home games and away games. And, like, I mean, look, I think the game started off being a little questionably officiated, but I think it balanced out. Uh, I think we win a five. I, if I would – I wouldn't be surprised if the Nuggets storm back in game three after going down 0-2. I mean, this is a resilient bunch. We've seen them come back from 3-1 twice in the same postseason. Jokic is bound for just an absolute monster game. I mean, he's yeah. one of the best players in the world. I think we win in five, close out at home. You know, I, I, I mean, I would not be shocked if we sweep them just because this Denver team isn't deep. But I think Jokic is too good, and Denver is too of a tough place to play for to for me to confidently say we'll sweep them. Yeah, I so got I worries. Would, I, would say five. I got worries in five as well. I think Denver will take a game in Denver, but then we'll win game five at home so the playoffs are in full swing and so is baseball coming up segment two jake and i are back on to talk about the oakland athletics they're back home after a long road stand we'll preview some games we'll recap some games do it all you guys will not want to miss out stay tuned Welcome back. Segment two on episode 12 of the Corker Cap covering the Oakland Athletics. I'm your host, Sam Corcoran. And Jake, it's been a very surprising start for the A's. Six and four coming off the road trip with a winning record, I believe. No, six, sorry, five and five. Six, we're six and five, excuse me. But coming off the road trip at 500, getting a win against the Orioles last night. How are you feeling about the start of the season? I, I mean, I feel great. Honestly, like every game has been, even the ones that we lost, they've been very competitive. I believe we lost two games by like four runs, and that was the worst it's been, which is very exciting to me. And I said last episode that on the road stand, four wins would be like a really solid starting point, and we even exceeded that. So I, I'm really excited to go. I mean, and then we're coming at home. We talked about this a little bit last episode, but our schedule gets quite a bit easier going at home against Baltimore for four at home against Texas for three, which Texas has been really struggling, and mm -hmm. then Giants and Guardians. So it's not uh, not heavily loaded. So I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, I think we're home. We are, we are in the Bay Area until May 4th, and that includes being at the Giants, but still, that's like – that, that's, that's really good for you guys to have – to be home from – April 18th to May 4th. That's kind of crazy. By by May 4th, Jake and I will end our year for college. We were just talking about that. We'll be we'll be out of college by then for just this year. Um, but yeah, it's kind of crazy to just think about that. But yeah, it's been a great week for the A's. And there's I think 
Honestly, like it really just starts. I think the Rays series was phenomenal. The Blue Jays, obviously, a bit more rough. You had two losses sprinkled in. Um, but overall, I think the key contributor with this was the pitching. I think the pitching this week was really good. I mean, you look at all our wins this all from the from the Rays and Blue Jays series, our two wins, or two of our three losses were Adam Aller pitching. And then the other one, I believe, was Dalton Jeffries. And other than that, Dalton Jeffries still did pretty decent job from what yeah, I yeah, remember. Yeah, four and a third with two runs, but it was just a lot of base runners. Yeah, lots of base runners. Um, But overall, I mean, let's just start off with Frankie Montes. I mean, we were kind of talking about like trade scenarios for him last week. That was the rumor that he could be being dealt to the White Sox for Andrew Vaughn. But I mean, he just showed last night. He had no hits through almost five innings, four and two thirds, I believe it was. Uh, he he absolutely locked down the Orioles, locked down the Rays. Just just phenomenal job from Frankie Montes. And then also I want to shout out Paul Blackburn. Paul Blackburn has been doing two starts. I believe he goes at it on Friday. No, Thursday against the Orioles. He pitches this series, yeah. Yeah, he'll pitch Thursday this series. But he's been he's two and oh. He's been killing it. Uh got our first win of the year, gets another win in Tampa. I, I think our uh I might be getting my Dates wrong. No, he got a win in Tampa. He got a win in Tampa and a win in Toronto. He got the win in Toronto. But yeah, no, overall, so he's been doing phenomenal. I think those two guys are two guys who I'm very excited by uh, doing a great job for the A's on their pitching staff. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the pitching staff, obviously, as a whole, has been doing great, other than Adam Aller, which we talked about, where they, they talk about him looking a lot better in a second start. I, I didn't necessarily feel that way. It looked like he struggled through a lot of innings still. Uh, he's got good movement on his pitches, but he's just, he's picking. He's not, he's not attacking any hitter and it's causing him to walk some batters and hitters can be more patient uh, and wait for their pitch to come over the middle. But um, yeah, the other four looked great. And even um, Cole Irvin, who's not necessarily his ERA is at five, four, I believe, but I mean, pitchers pitching on the road, especially on the A's, if you keep your ERA in like that, four range you're gonna have a really solid in the three zra just because of how much of a pitcher's park the eight the coliseum is and i mean mm -hmm. you kind of saw that yesterday where a lot of the and i i specifically remember some of the a's hitters where it would the ball with the balls would get in the air and then they would just hang up especially yeah you know games the christian pache one where he just stroked like it looked like the one to take the two run lead in uh toronto and yeah it just hung up and it was like a casual fly ball and yeah, you know who talked about that? I was listening to the radio broadcast. Uh, it was either Catroni or Ken Clark was talking about that. How outfielders just hate. I mean, I, it, it like it's like it's a hitter's ballpark. I mean, sorry, pitcher's ballpark. Excuse me. Uh, but like, it, it makes it so much easier on the outfielders overall, and like it's easier to feel the ball that way. And I think that helps the pitchers a lot. Yeah. Um, and then like outside of that, if we're looking at other pitchers, I wrote down. I think Grimm and Jimenez coming out of the pen. Beyond like the guys we talked about last week, like Puck and some of the other guys who were on the um, COVID list. But I mean, Graham is a guy who we could trade if he has a really solid season because he's only on a one year deal. Um, mm -hmm. Get yeah, deadline, pick us up like a maybe a late top 30 prospect or just someone else to throw on the, the roster. Um, and then Jimenez, he, I, I really liked him when he pitched on the Giants. I was going to talk about him. Yeah. Um, he, he kind of struggled last night. He got uh, a little lucky at the end there. but um, Got the save. No, not last night. It even, wasn't a save opportunity? He got he got the save in Toronto. He, they were up four last oh, night. Oh, okay. But um, gotcha. so they're giving him late inning work. He pitched in the eighth, I believe, two days ago. Um, mm -hmm. So, I don't know. He's he's looking good. He's obviously got a lot of trust from uh, the, the managerial staff. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely think, especially with Trevino out with COVID, he could definitely step into that role, that closer role. We kind of saw him last night. I know it wasn't a save opportunity, but he stepped into that role to try to close out the game. Didn't do too well last night, but you know what? He can always bounce back. Closers always have games where they get roughed up. They blow saves here and there. But, you know, he's been looking really good so far, and the A's have been able to do that with their closers. You saw Blake Trinan. You saw Liam Hendricks. Liam Hendricks is now one of the best closers in all of baseball. He was a product of the A's. Even, I mean, Lou Trevino, too, he's been decent for the A's as well. Uh, last year, this, I mean, this year he struggled a little bit, but like he's been a good setup man now in that closer role. He's looking really good. And the A's bullpen 
has been doing a fantastic job, in my opinion. I would, I think in the Tampa series, I think Kirby Sneed did really well. Obviously, he's now on the COVID list. Uh, unvaccinated player cannot play in Toronto, but overall, he did well, and he did well in Tampa, which made a big loss for us. And I think, I, I think the one guy who I think in our bullpen who he's been doing a good job, but at the same time, he's definitely a bit risky is Domingo Acevedo. And I got, into, I talked about people with this on Twitter. Like he, his, his motion is just so wild. And he's just like, he, he's, he's a very wild pitcher. And you just never know what you're going to get from him. Yeah. He, he's a, he's a strikeout guy who doesn't have high velocity, which exactly. again, another guy who's picking around the zone. And even when he has good outings, quote unquote, he gets hit hard. And he gets runners to get on base against him. So I, he was one of the guys at the beginning of the year who I said if if he comes out and looks good he, with his frame and his um, pitch development, he could come out and be one of the the sta- the staples of the A's bullpen. And he definitely has looked like that so far. Uh-huh. They they pitch him almost every night, which uh, kind of that almost Yasmero Petit role from years past, where it seems mm-hmm. like whenever I look down at the bullpen, it's Acevedo warming up, but. He gets hit a lot, and uh, so he's going to need to show me something else for me to get excited when he comes out. Absolutely. He's going to need a bit more time. Sorry, something just fell on my floor really quickly. But, yeah, I think overall, Acevedo has been – he's been looking good, but I just don't know how much he can keep that up. So, yeah. What about hitting, though? I think the hitting, obviously the offense has been – you need offense to get those runs to win games. So, Jake, any guys that have been standing out to you on offense? I don't yeah, know there's well, a lot of guys. So let's just let's just hear from like what you think the best guys are. I mean, as as you kept seeing, if if you've watched any A's games on the broadcast, they continually talk about best team hitting with runners in scoring position. And it's that's ridiculous. Why, that's why the A's have the most runs in the MLB, but <laughs> everyone on their team seems to be hitting 220. Like mm-hmm. they've somehow found a balance. But um the I, I wrote down four guys that I was really excited about. Some of them don't need to be uh, really named like Murphy and Pache. We've talked about a lot in the past. But the oh, other yeah. two, Noisy and Bethancourt. Bethancourt, the numbers don't necessarily show it so far, but he's put together a lot of really good competitive ABs. Looks like he's got some pop in his bat. He just is waiting for his pitch, and it, it'll come around, you know. But he looks confident up there, and he never looks overpowered, which I'm really excited about. And Noisy obviously had a great night last night. He seems to be – like taking his approach back, cutting down his swing, being willing to go oppo and beat that shift. So uh, he's really exciting, especially with his versatility, being able to play second, uh, third, and a little bit of short and first. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, Noise has been really stepping up and showing that he's really the guy at third base. And Kevin Smith had a decent week. Not like it's it's nothing too impressive, but. Sheldon Noisy has been a lot better than him, and he's been doing really well. I'm really excited to see him. Uh, and Bethancourt, too, that's a great call-up right there. I, I you, you didn't really expect anything from him. He hadn't played in the majors since 2017, but you call him up, call him up, and he does really well. So I'm, I'm really happy to see what he's doing. And speaking of call-ups, let's talk about the guy that Jake and I have been hyping up all year, waiting for him to come up. Nick Allen is finally in an A's uniform, Jake. And, I mean – it's it's for a substitute player. I know Lowry went on the COVID list, but I think Nick Allen could be here to stay. I'm hoping that they can finally use him in the lineup tonight, maybe give him his first MLB at bat. That, I would love to see that, especially against a team like Baltimore. Those bat teams, you really get to prove yourselves there. You really get to show like what you can do on the field against a team who, who might not be the best. When they face a better team, it might be a bit more difficult. But looking at what Nick Allen can do, I think this is a perfect opportunity for him to get a start. Yeah, I, I really hope that we can see him. I'm like, I, I was telling Sam before the show, I'm spam refreshing my like feed on Bleacher Report to see if the lineup is right. <laughs> I want to see Nick Allen play so bad. Um, might be an off like off night for Anderson. I know he had one a couple nights ago, but um, that, that would just be so exciting. He's a guy who has hit a lot better in the past. Obviously, we've talked about his defensive prowess, a potential perennial gold glove winner. Um, so I, I'm just excited to see him come back. And then as far as – I don't know if you had anyone in mind for uh, guys who have disappointed you hitting-wise a little bit. But um, I have two that – one I talked about last week and the other might surprise you. But um, the first one is Seth Brown, who I, I just – he hit those two home runs. And I even talked about it after he had hit the home runs and the numbers looked really good. His at-bats just are not competitive at-bats. They aren't. 
strikes out in miserable fashion about half the time. And it's just, it, it it's a struggle to watch him sometimes. He lets those arms go and he just gul- tries to golf it over the right field fence. And it just, it's not working. He needs to take a different approach and kind of the shift is so crazy against him. If he would just nudge it down anywhere. I mean, Olsen even was laying down bunts the last few years. Um, so I, I would love to see that for him. And then uh, this is your guy. And I hate to say it, but Tony Kemp. Kemp, I, I get it. He gets on base, but he still doesn't have an extra base hit. And he's like, he makes some plays look really difficult defensively. Like, yeah, him, him being five, six, I get that it, it makes some plays, like some fully extended plays where he grabs it and he throws it look really great. But it's they're just not that tough of plays that he's making look really difficult, in my opinion. And then he also makes a lot of throwing errors where it's almost like watching when we had, do you remember when Jerickson Profar was over there and he had the yips? Yeah, I do remember that. You have to like run it up and like lob it. And I'm just like, I'm watching Kemp like sidearm sling it into the fucking dugout and – I don't know, but um, yeah, no, I I can see that totally. I think Tony Kemp has a little bit to work on himself. Uh, I I think hitting wise, I think getting on base is really all you need from a leadoff hitter. So I'm not too concerned about that. But his feeling this week, it, it's it's been a bit stingy. I definitely can agree with you on that, and I can get behind you on that. But overall, I think hitting wise, I I, I can see where you're coming from. I know he has to get those extra base hits, but right now, I think. I really think he's he's he should be a guy who's in the lineup. If he's not getting those extra base hits by the end of this week, he's got get he's definitely got to get some more. Uh maybe you move him back in the lineup. Maybe you move him to like last in the lineup or something. Yeah. Um. And then as far as another topic that uh, I'd want to talk about is uh, Loriano potentially returning. I I think it's what May. It's middle of May that he comes. Yeah, back. somewhere mid May. So that could be like the Angels series, or I think we host the Tigers after that. Because I think it was like it was something like 20, 23, 24 games into the season. So uh, where where do you think he fits into this lineup, and potentially where where can we see him in the field? It's going to be tough. He's not. To, I don't think he's taking Pache's spot in center. You're going to probably put him in left, and left fielder does change every day. It's 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 going to be interesting. Maybe you go. With, I, I think you start Murphy at catcher, first base, Seth Brown, second base, Tony Kemp. Yeah, I think you're forced. Shortstop, there. Nick Allen, third base, it's it's between Noiser and Pinder. I think I got to go Pinder for now. And you're going to see some switching in the lineup. Right field, Piscotti, center field, Pache, left field, Loriano. I think that's where, and oh, and you need a DH. You give, give that to Noisy right there. Yeah, and I mean, you could even see a good, like noisy at second, Pinder at third, and maybe those two flip flopping, and then Kemp DHing or Lowry DHing. Um, yeah, but like in terms of the outfield spots, there's so many. Like, I mean, right now the A's only have like four outfielders anyway, so I, I yeah. think he slots in pretty well to get his uh, everyday spot back, and I'd be excited because I mean, he he was one of our best hitters, even with. Chapman, Olsen, Marte, uh, Canna, all those guys. So him coming back will be a, a big deal. And then um, another thing to monitor, I don't know if we said this last week, but uh, they keep talking it up uh, on the air. But Andrus, 550 plate appearances, and then he gets a $15 million option next year, which you know the A's are not going to pay. So yeah, going to get traded or he's not going to be a, a starting shortstop. And that's why we – are so excited about Nick Allen because him coming up potentially gives them the opportunity to uh, not start Andrus every day where I actually do think he's been hitting a lot better lately. He's but- been doing really well. You could definitely put him on his positive list. And I, I, I didn't mention him in that, in that thing in where I gave like a good lineup for that reason. I, th- I think the A's are going to try to, I, I don't know what they're going to try. It, it, it depends on how the season's going. If he's doing well, if the A's are doing well, you have to play him obviously, but other than that, man, it, it, it's 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 going to be a tricky situation, I think. Yeah, I mean, I saw he even came up in an article I was reading that was like top ten trade targets at the deadline, and it said it was Andrus to the Angels, which 
if we can get anything for Elvis Andrus to get his contract out of here, that that's fine with me. Um, totally. I, he's, I, I like him as a guy, but he just is not a, not performed up to snuff for, I mean, we gave up what well, we gave up Jonah Heim for him. So, oh, and Heim is doing, yeah. it. he's killing it in Texas right now. So yeah, he is, a, he is that. definitely doing well. We'll see. There's a lot of interesting stuff to come to the A's. We'll see what happens. Keep you posted for next week, but coming up, the NFL draft is nine days away. Zach and I are on going to talk about the draft, talk about some of his favorite prospects, my favorite prospects. You guys will not want to miss out. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Segment three on episode 12 of the Cork and Cat. Moving on to a segment we have not covered yet. The NFL Draft. We are less than two weeks away. I'm your host, Sam Corcoran. To my right is the draft expert himself at ZCOPE3, Zach Kopeman. I mean, Zach, it's the most exciting time of the month for football. How are you feeling about the draft? Uh, I love the draft. Um, I get really into it every year. So this is kind of my my place to shine. Uh, I'm hyped. It's in a couple weeks. So we'll we'll take a look. Yeah, absolutely. The draft, I, mean, I know last year, if you guys were watching the channel last year and the year before, you know I was all over the draft, especially with the Niners pick. Now, the Niners don't have as high as a pick, but I've still been covering it here and there. But that doesn't lead up to what, Z- what Zach's been doing for the draft. He has his own big board right here, which I will link in the description if that's okay with you. And I'll tweet that out and everything. Make sure that people can see this as well. But he's got his own big board. So we're going to go over this and we're just going to go – we're kind of going to just scroll down, talk about some sleepers, talk about some positions, talk about all that. Zach can give some analysis. I can give some analysis myself. So let's just jump into it. And this is an untimed segment of the episode. We're going to go however long we want to on this. So let's start off with the top 10. And right off the bat, I know a lot of people are saying Aiden Hutchinson, Kayvon Thibodeau are the te- best players, but you have Evan Neal one. Can you uh, explain that to me? Um. Evan Neal to me, I mean, pass rush and tackle, um, I think are the two most important positions. And just in my opinion, right after quarterback, um, there's not really that generational quarterback who's going to go number one in this class. I think we, we, we've established that by now. Mm-hmm. Um, Evan Neal just, he has the size, he has the athleticism, he has uh, talent at, or he's, he has uh, experience at left and right tackle where he's probably going to slot in at one of them. I don't think he's going to go number one. Um, I think he's the number one talent because he's got experience at both tackle spots and at guard, but he's going to play tackle in the NFL. Prototypical size, it's uh, 6'7", 345, and he has the quickness to keep up with like today's pass rushers, which I think is a really underrated thing about him. Um, I don't think he's a very underrated player. I think a lot of people have him at one. A lot of people have Hutchinson at one, who is my number two player. But uh, yeah, I just have Neil at one. It's a similar grade. Yeah, I would also I would also go Evan Neal at number one, protecting Mac Jones. He protected Bryce Young. Uh, I definitely think Evan Neal is the best player in this class. I think Hutchinson and Thibodeau, I think, are a 2A, 2B. I think you could go with either player. One has all the upside, whereas one has the higher floor. In my opinion, Thibodeau has the upside. Hutchinson has the floor. But I think if you're looking for the highest upside and the highest floor, I'm going with Evan Neal there. And that's really – I know we Zach and I were kind of talking about how we grade our players, and I think that's something I take into effect. Who has the highest ceiling? Who has the highest floor? Or who has the lowest floor, I should say? And kind of take that into effect right there. And I think when you look at at the end of the day, the highest ceiling and the highest floor goes to Evan Neal. I mean, versatility is something you love seeing – in an offensive lineman, especially in the draft. I know we've seen in the past few years, Elijah Vera Tucker going high, uh, Panay Sewell. I know he fell a little bit, but he still went very high. Uh, other guy, I mean, there's other guys who are drafted. Rashawn Slater could play guard or tackle. He went very high. And other, they, they, you can move them around a little bit. Uh, will he go number one to Jacksonville? Probably not. They have Cam Robinson, they have Juwan Taylor, who's all right. But at the end of the day, they need a pass rusher. They kind of missed on Caleb on chase on. And we'll talk about more about that pick later next week. We're going to do some mock drafts on the channel in a special episode. You guys will not want to miss that. But the top three, I think we can all, in my opinion, I would put it in the same top three order as well. Moving down the list, I, I, I think this is a very solid top 10 in my opinion. I think Jermaine Johnson is one guy who could be a bit high on this list. I would put a guy who you have at 12, Trayvon Walker, ahead of him. I know there's been conversation about him going one. 
But Ahmad Gardner right here at six, probably one of my favorite players in this draft. A lockdown corner. He could be very good in the NFL. I think he will be very good in the NFL. And you've seen teams really want this guy. He should be on top, maybe even top five. Maybe he'll go four to the Jets. Um, yeah, I'll just hit on a couple of points he made there. Um, you know, you said the top three was set. I've seen a lot of guys with Iki Iquanu, even at one. Um, Iquanu, almost to me, I don't, I think he's, he's the best run blocker in the class. I think he's better than Evan Neal at that. Um, he's played tackle. I think he comes in and if he plays guard, he's a pro bowl guard day one. But, um, I don't, I don't know, uh, if he has the pass protection, uh, to play tackle at a high level at day one. So that's why I have him down there at five. Um, Jermaine Johnson, I think, has the upside. He had the production this year, too, which is exactly what you want to see out of a, out of a pass rusher. Um, he's a guy, he's been through a lot. He's a walk-on. He, he transferred to Georgia, didn't work out there particularly. Didn't wasn't bad, but didn't really get on the field with that really talented defense. Went and, and showed out at Florida State. And a lot of people have concerns about him being a one-year wonder, but I think he has the athleticism. Um he almost, in a way, reminds me of another Florida State pass rusher, Brian Burns. Um, I think he he could be a, a very similar player. The reason I have Walker down there at 12 is uh, I know at least Trent Balk, a guy you don't like, uh, compared him <laughs> oh, God. to Alden to Alden Smith. Um, yep. He just doesn't he just doesn't have the reps at a uh, at edge rusher that uh, uh, that you know the other guys that I have a little higher than him do he uh he played a little bit inside um they had him all over and he has some pass coverage reps even um so i think he has a lot of upside it's just i don't i think the floor is pretty low with him um he he wasn't extremely productive he wasn't on the field all the time he wasn't playing his natural position all the time but he is 275 he is super athletic i could see the argument for him even going one yeah totally i think definitely you look at a guy i think one guy last year who was kind of in that range of very raw pass rusher. And I don't think they're similar players at all, but Gregory Russo was in that range. He fell a lot. You could see Trayvon Walker fall a lot. You also could see him skyrocket in the draft. The Trying to think of a guy who went high with a pretty high ceiling last year, but no one's coming to mind right off the bat. Um, but yeah, I definitely think, I think Trayvon Walker at 12, I think the top 10, I, I mean, I, I think you could slide him in there. I can definitely see the argument for how he cannot, but the one guy I want to hear how he's in on the top 10, Kyle Hamilton. I mean, I think Kyle Hamilton, in my opinion, is a bona fide top 10 player in this class. Uh, he, I mean, he's just the best safety in this class by far in a way. Athletic, sees the field very well, makes plays. I just, this is your ideal safety to have in the NFL. And I don't see how he's not top 10. Um, you know, I don't, I don't disagree. I think Kyle Hamilton is a, is a very, or at least started off this process as a generational safety. He ran a four seven at his pro day, I think. Um, either at his pro day, I don't think he did at the combine. Um, that's that's slow. Um, obviously, yeah. he plays faster in game tape, um, but a lot of that is based on his instincts, um, reading the play before it happens rather than getting to the play when it happens. So I think he could get beat a lot by uh, guys one on one, a lot of tight ends. I think he could match up well, but. Um, he could get beat by those guys by faster running backs. Maybe if he's on a receiver, even um, he could play deep. Obviously, I think he profiles well in the box too. You can move him around, and he's still a very good player. But part of my reasoning of having him at eleven is I don't place a lot of value on the safety position as it is. I think he does all those things for you. But you look at a guy like Jamal Adams who went six a few years ago. Not similar players, but. Um, he's been limited to a box role. It really it depends on what a team sees in, in Hamilton, and I think he's a more versatile player than a guy like Jamal Adams. But um, a lot of teams aren't going to place value on the safety position, and I don't I don't value it very highly either. I think he's a great player, but he has his faults, and he's a safety, which isn't a very highly valued position. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with that. That safety is not very valued, but if, I, I think the versatility also gets him into the top ten. Right there, and I know, I know. This I'm going to bring out a little hot take right here. I think the 50 time, the the 40 time is one of the most worthless things at the combine, in my opinion, because you see a ton of guys play faster than they are. I think one example, uh, it was Brandon Ayuk ran a four five at the combine, and he might not be known as one of the fastest players in the NFL, but he plays a lot faster than that, and his speed does not affect him as well. And he was considered a slow receiver coming out of college when his speed, in reality doesn't really affect him at all and doesn't really affect his play on the field. That's just a personal opinion of mine. 
uh, hot uh, if take. I, if, I can, if I can interject in there, I mean, it's very fair. I mean, I was looking at a lot of the raw athletic scores uh, for a lot of the free safeties who ended up becoming pro bowlers. Um, uh, a guy who posts a lot of the RAS scores was uh, posting those today. And, you know, there's a trend where a lot of safeties who aren't particular, they didn't particularly test well, they aren't particularly athletic, they still become pro bowlers. And I think Kyle Hamilton is a pro bowl level player. It oh, just, yeah. it, it really, like, there's some faults in there that, you know, a lot of his game is based on instincts. And while his instincts are incredible, best in the class, best in, in years, I'd say, um, I don't I don't value a player based on, you know, he's 6'4 and has instincts. That, that's not where I'm going to place a lot of value. And I, I still think he's a top player. I just don't see him in the top 10. Fair enough. Fair enough, I guess. Uh, let's move on to another position. Uh, I just talked about Brendan Ayuk. Let's talk about his position right here, wide receiver. There are three, four, there are four, ride, five wide receivers in the top 20. Uh, and I know last year's class was stacked at wide receivers. Zach, would you say it's as stacked or less stacked or even more stacked? Because we're seeing a lot of receiver talent early on your board. Um, I think these guys that I'm placing pretty high – a lot of them are either upside or they had an issue in their last year of college or they were one years like Jamison Williams. Jamison Williams, um, yep. So a lot of these guys higher on the board, I think they're worth mid-first round picks of, other than Wilson. Um, I don't know what the receiver depth is going to look like in this draft. Um, I think there's a lot of guys that, you know, they do one thing very well. Um, even a lot of the guys in the first round, they do one thing very well. Um, you're going to see later, I have Drake London a little further down the board than a lot of people. You do. I was just he, looking at wide receivers has, right as now. As a top 10 pick, um, I just don't value what he does as highly as a guy like Garrett Wilson, who I believe is your all-around receiver, your all-around X in this class. He he brings a lot of what Stephon Diggs brings to a team, in my opinion. I don't know if he has that kind of upside, but I think he could be a very productive X, a very productive number one. Um, you look at my next receiver down the board, Chris Olave. Um, sort of opposite of that, I think he he comes in right away and is a very high level Z. Um, will play wide receiver too. I I'd assume he'd fill that role most of his career. And I I'm not saying drafting a wide receiver two in the first round should be your intent, but as your number two guy, like that's a pretty a, solid like, option. You you need to have multiple number one receivers in today's league, in my opinion. It's such a passing heavy league. And Chris Olave is going to be a number one receiver along with another number one receiver. He's going to play Z, um, and I think he he plays Z at the highest level in this class. So the two Ohio State guys um, are my are my top two receivers. And I want to bring up a point about Olave really quickly because that argument last year was used against one of the best rookie wide receivers, Jalen Waddell. Two years ago, used against Jeff, Justin Jefferson. So even though you're drafting a wide receiver two maybe off the bat – it may not be that way for that long. Yeah, he and Olave was going to be has, a Olave was probably going to be a, like a high second rounder last year too, and he made improvements this mm -hmm. year. That's something you love to see. He he has high level speed. Um, he has good size. He does everything you want from a Z receiver right now, and that's not saying he can't improve. So I I like him as my 14th player on the board. Absolutely, me too. I think I think I I would agree with your one two. I would definitely go one Garrett Wilson. To Olave. Three, you have Pickens. I do like that pick. I would personally put Jamison Williams ahead of him, but the injury is also the injury looks a bit rough. So um yeah, the injury speaking didn't of really it, factor into that for me. Um really okay that real quick. Um obviously it's gonna take a while for him to recover. I think he'll be ready for the season. I think Jamison Williams right away also profiles as a Z, profiles as a slot, even. Um, I think he's not gonna be able to handle press coverage very well right away. And you're going to have to kind of scheme him open. Pickens, I think, has the traits of an X. He blocks very well, which is underrated for a receiver. Um, not a lot of people are talking first round, or at least even this high in the first round for him. Um, he showed he's faster than he ran, which you were talking about 40 times a little overrated. For receivers, um, a guy who ran a 4-5, maybe even maybe a high 4-4. Four, That's four, nothing. Um, he's he's going to he's gonna run faster than that in the NFL. He's got great size. He's got great hands. I think he's everything you want out of a solid X. He's kind of got the build of AJ Green, and I think he could he could hit the level of, you know, 
Now, I'm not saying he's going to be DeAndre Hopkins, but a lot of his game reminds me of what DeAndre, DeAndre Hopkins can do out there and kind of an A.J. Green build. Interesting. Definitely definitely an Ida Kim especially if he slips. That would be very fun for a team, maybe like a who Kansas City. I know we always rumor every receiver to them could see someone like that. But if you guys have been looking at this screen for a while, there has been one name glaring at you and that is matt corral the quarterback out of old miss zach this is your qb1 um it, it's definitely a, a a lot of people don't have him as qb1 but i know you and i were talking about this earlier i have him as qb2 i have willis one and matt corral two it's a very close two i think matt corral i think willis i'm putting him because of his ceiling and this is something i did last year with trey lance i don't think willis is a day one starter I don't think maybe any of these quarterbacks are day one starters. If you want a day one starter, maybe you go Kenny Pickett. But at the end of the day, I think Matt Corral and Malik Willis have the highest upside in this class by far and away. And I'm going with Malik Willis when I'm going to take that higher upside over Matt Corral's upside. But I want to hear your point about Matt Corral being QB1. This is a guy who you've been targeting a lot, and you've always been targeting him. This is... Uh, a guy that since day one has been my quarterback one going into this year. I mean, obviously your mic's Malik going will, on and off. I don't know if I'm, that's I'm me sorry. or that. It's, um, at, oh, any, any better? Yeah, that's good. Perfect. All right. All right. Um, sorry. Start over. Yeah. Matt Corral has been my, my first quarterback on the board for as long as I can remember. And that's not saying I, I can't change, but this is not something I'm going to change on. I've watched a lot of Matt Corral. Um, I'll say it right now. He's he's not ready to play in a pro style offense. He ran RPO mm-hmm. this year, um, and a lot of the teams, not a lot, but a few teams in the N- in the NFL are running RPO now. You see the Eagles with Jalen Hurts, but it's still um, off again. Yeah, <sighs> shit. Give me a sec. You're good. While he says that, I think uh, let's just look at the quarterbacks on his board: Matt Corral, Malik Willis, Desmond Ritter, Desmond Ritter over Kenny Pickett. And Sam Howell over Kenny Pickett. I saw something about Sam Howell being one of the best quarterbacks in the class. And I think you can make an argument for all of these quarterbacks being best in the class. If I had to rank a top five, I would go Willis one, Corral two, Pickett three, Ritter four, and then uh, Howell five. I'm going Pickett. I know I say I like the upside, but at some point you have to consider the floor. And I think Pickett's floor could be the highest in this class. At the same time, it also could be worse. Zach, you kind of compared him to uh 2020 baker mayfield the season where the browns made the playoffs with him so that's i i definitely like that comparison a lot but uh let's go back to corral and then we can talk about picking it a little bit yeah corral he plays in an rpo system a few teams are picking that up now um it's it's a good way to play but um i think he'll sit a year or two to get ready in the nfl offense i i think he has a comparable arm to willis uh willis has got a good arm but tends to overthrow his receivers not really on the deep ball, which is a little weird, but on the shallow balls, on the medium balls, he'll overthrow his receivers a little bit, and he looks to run first. And what I like about Corral is even though he's got mobility, he's got athleticism, and he's a strong runner for his size, he's not always looking to run first. He's, he's past Scott. He's got the arm. I think he's got all the traits. Um, He's exactly what I look for in a, in a QB1, especially in a class where, you know, I not none of these guys are – our first round picks last year, in my opinion, maybe Corral sneaks into the end. Maybe, I, I think Willis would sneak into the end, similar to like a Jordan Love. But last year, like, yeah, I definitely, I think oh, every time. Sorry, you're my, you're my kind of cut out again, but you're good. I you thought you stopped talking. No, you're, you're good. Dude. You're, I, I finished my point. You're good. Okay, perfect. I was just gonna say, uh, about Malik Willis. I definitely think I have him QB one. I think, I agree. He is a very raw quarterback, and I don't see him starting day one. Personally, I think I know he's been rumored to go with number two overall alliance. I think that's absolutely crazy. I don't think he should be in the top 10, but I mean, it's quarterback. It's the most valuable position, but if we're writing it just on talent, then Malik Willis is a top 20 player, not top 10. Uh, Also, I do believe I'm, I'm putting him above Matt Corral because I think the way that the NFL is changing, you're seeing a lot more mobile quarterbacks go off the board early. And I definitely think the NFL is changing to a, a run first league, even though you have those passing options. And I think Willis can pass the ball. He has some struggles doing it. I know the Syracuse game we had, we went to, he had some struggles passing the ball a little bit, but I think when you look for the best running quarterback in this draft, it's Malik Willis. And I think this league is turning into a run first league. A lot of teams are looking for these run first guys at quarterback. 
So that's why I'm going with Malik Willis as QB1. And I, I, I see you I completely think, disagree. Looking, I don't think teams are looking for run first, guys. Run first quarterbacks don't want to throw the ball. That's a guy like Garrett Schrader who is – at this pace, not going to sniff the NFL. Oh, he's a running back. Um, yeah. So you look at Malik Willis, who I'm not saying he's a run first guy, but he looks to run a lot. And teams don't want number one, they don't want their quarterback getting hurt. If you're running on every play, you're going to get hurt. That's just the nature of the game. Um, number two, like you, you want to move the. It's still a passing league. As much as you think it's going to be a run first league, passing is so important. Let me let me clarify real quick about my point. I would say run first. If if, I, if run first is the wrong trend, I'm looking. I, I guess I'm looking for like a mobile quarterback league, a dual yeah. threat quarterback league. I think that Corral's Corral's got that mobility. Obviously, he's not Malik Willis. Malik Willis has unreal athleticism. Um, I think you know what I I don't disagree that he's got the highest upside. It's just what is what is the path to get there. Yeah, definitely. I think I think Matt Corral. I I think that that's why I'm putting them like very similar to each other i think overall if you want the upside of malik willis you can either go the upside of malik willis or the ceiling or the or the floor excuse me of um matt corral and i think it's going to come down to those two it also could come down to kenny pickett who you have as your fifth best quarterback uh i know some teams have him at one and i want to hear more about that from you um it, it comes down to i think his ceiling is low and i think desmond ritter is more pro ready so, um, why enough. would I not have Desmond Ritter above him? I think Howell has a has a has a pretty solid floor too. I think at minimum with Howell, you're getting a a really really good backup, um, and I think he will have a few years starting in the league. Somebody's going to draft him to start for them, and we're going to see how that works out. I think he's got good traits, um, but Pickett, he's going to come in probably be a day one starter. Honestly, I I envision him as that. And I don't, I don't see him failing. I just see him. I what is what does he do special? He's accurate. That's what you can say about Kenny Pickett. Yeah, I think Kenny Pickett. It, it, it's it's kind of a similar comparison, um, to Matt, like kind of the Mac Jones, um, and everything. Just like from last year, just a guy with a very high ceiling, and a or a very low ceiling and an extremely high floor. And I think that's where you're kind of getting a pick. And I know teams like that, but I don't think you're going to get much out of him. I know where Mac Jones is a pro bowler, and I know it's working out for New England thus far. But you also look at teams like Cleveland. They took Baker Mayfield, very similar, didn't really work out. Daniel Jones, that was another guy, didn't really work out. Uh, well, the, other, the other difference with the other difference with Mac and Pickett is Pickett was not Pickett started for years and has not been productive up until this year. This is. He brought Pitt to a very good season. I won't deny that. Um, I don't I don't know how much he elevated that team before here. So you have one year of really high-level play from Pickett where he's not showcasing any elite arm talent, any elite athleticism. Um, he's not particularly throwing the ball a million yards. So he's just a very, a very average, average prospect in my eyes. I can get behind that. I think – He'll probably go first round, but I don't think I'm expecting too, too much out of Kenny Pickett right there. Uh, looking at the rest of the draft board, do you have any other comments you wanted to say about your uh, first top 50 guys? Um, Yeah, here. I'm actually just going to scroll through it myself. I know we we glossed over a few of the receivers. Um, I'm higher on Traylon Burks than Drake London. I think Drake London has been getting a lot of Mike Evans comparisons. Um, I don't I don't really see that. I, I don't think he's as special as London. Traylon Burks gives you a lot in the, uh, in the underneath game. Um, you know, you could put him on a screen almost similar to a Debo Samuel, but he's bigger. Um, he's built like a running back 225. Um, he's going to run through guys. Um, a few other guys, um, that I have here. Um, Linda bomb at, at 33. I think people would argue with, That's where they're, um, Oh, I have a question. David J. Bo, yeah. does, is that factoring in the injury? That's definitely factoring in the injury. I I think he was a first round pick before that. Um, yeah, super athletic. The only thing he really lacks is um, you can't play him on rundowns. He was not a great run defender. Um, almost opposite of a guy like Daniel Hunter coming out, but Daniel Hunter developed into a very good pass rusher. So I think you can kind of develop him and mold him into being a very good. He'd probably be a three four outside linebacker, a very good run stopper. 
But mm-hmm. um, right when he comes into the league, he's not going to be playing uh, most downs. He'll be playing pass downs. Um, kind of looking at like a D4 type of guy maybe? Yeah. Um, I think he fits a guy like uh, Don Martindale's system. I, I've seen him mocked originally to the Ravens and now a lot to the Giants just because he's super athletic. He has coverage reps. Um, he just lacks, lacks a little bit in run defense. I think he'll be good at the scheme. Yeah, I definitely think I think Ajabo was probably going to be a top 10 pick. The Achilles injury is always a massive blow right there. He'll probably go round two, maybe late round one. I don't know, but I think I, I definitely agree with you. You really see him perform on those pass down plays, and I think that's what brings him up here. Um, if we keep scrolling through the list, um, I know a lot of Niners fans have been high on Kingsley uh, and Agbari, I think it's pronounced your name, and Christian Watson. Yeah. Uh, I personally, just as a Niners fan, and Rohit and I are going to talk about this uh, in the next segment about Niners guys we can draft. I think those guys are going to go a bit higher than we, we, where we're at. We're at 61. I don't think we're going to make a move up. Um, but overall, I think these two guys are studs. I like the, I like the ranking of them right there. Um, I think Watson, Watson could be a first-round guy even. I think Aguilabare actually does have a chance to get down to 62. But a guy, there's a few other pass rushers who you're going to see around this range. You look at an Arnold Ebikede. Who's getting a lot of buzz now? Um, a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry. You, you look at a guy like Arnold Ebikede, I think You're good. might be more in your range, although uh, he's getting a little buzz higher up. Um, D'Angelo De- Malone. This is a guy a lot there. of people have been talking about. D'Angelo very, Malone. Very productive pass rusher out of out of Western Kentucky. Um, there's a mm-hmm. there's a lot of a lot of buzz around here. If you scroll up a little, there's a couple guys that I think people would have a little lower uh, at 56 and 57. You look at Marcus Jones, who is a one of my favorite players out of Houston. Oh, I love this guy. Um, this could be one of my favorite players in the draft. Um, I think he comes in day one and is an elite slot corner. Uh, he's got incredible, incredible coverage ability. Um, just unmatched, I think, in this class by by few guys in the slot. The issue is he's five eight. I think that's that's the only issue I have with him. Um, and then Daniel Falele is a guy that I was higher on last year when he could have potentially came out. I see a lot of Jordan Mailata in him. Um, I think he has I that agree. ceiling. I think his floor is just very, very low, considering he's a little high on his pass reps. He can get thrown off balance. Um, he he did drop weight, but he was originally 400 pounds, so he might have to drop a little bit more. So he's definitely a Massive. project. But I, I see a lot of upside with this guy, much much higher than anyone else or a lot of other people on, on him just just because of a guy like Mylotta, who I, I think is just a great right tackle. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely can get behind that. And I definitely think, yeah, he's probably going to fall a bit later down in the draft. Um, same with Marcus Jones. I've seen Marcus Jones going round five, but he's a fantastic slot corner. Um, uh, let's talk about the Marvin Leal real quick. Uh, the defensive tackle from... Texas A&M, this was a guy who was once a first-round pick. What happened to him? Um, You know, he's just not getting the same I can't hear buzz, a thing you're saying. Uh, I'm going to give it a sec. I don't know why it's why it's acting like this today. It's usually a pretty solid microphone. You're good. No, it's all good. Hey, we make it work. People understand what we're saying. Um, Yeah, he – I think people just don't know where he he fits in a defense. Is he uh, – is he going to slim down and be a four three end? Is he going to be a, a three four end? Um, he doesn't really have a lot of reps at either. More he has more reps at edge. So I think it's just about that, not really knowing where he fits, and maybe he didn't test particularly well. I'm still a fan of his. I think he could be a good player. Yeah, I mean he definitely has the talent. I de- obviously fits a big thing, uh, but I, I I think Leo will probably go. I've seen him fall on most boards too. I think round one, round two, you're probably looking at him going. I know once he was top yeah. 10 pick, obviously this year was a down year for him uh, as we see by this ranking and the other rankings and everything. Um, so yeah, I definitely think DeMarvin Leal could be a good pick. We'll have to see what happens. So scrolling down the board, um, trying to find some other guys. I know you talked about the Central Michigan tackles earlier with me. Um, yeah, Rain Man's a guy who's getting a little bit of first round buzz. It's weird that people kind of consider him a side guy, and he's a 24 year old. He's, uh, you know, he's um, a former tight end. So people think he still has a little bit to prove. But, um, you know, obviously he's on the older side. Um, 
I don't think he's super polished yet. Um, he's obviously very athletic. I think he he has a chance to be a very a very solid tackle, probably a, a right tackle. I think he played left in college. Uh, but I think uh, I think it's go deke, go go deck. Uh, I can't hear we'll it. We'll call thing. him it's Luke. Out. Where do you know where I cut out? You were cut like I I I think he has a chance to become a very solid tackle and then butt yada yada yada. Yeah, I think I think uh, sixty seven on the board. I can't really pronounce Luke's name. Um, mm-hmm. He might profile a little bit better at guard, but I think he's just a more polished player right now. I feel that. Yeah, I haven't watched too much of these guys, but you know, Central Michigan, they always know how to get their offensive tackles produced. Uh, Raymond is a guy who I have seen higher than uh, I think it's good that. Gadecki or something, maybe something like that. I don't really know how to pronounce that name, but yeah, I I've seen him a bit higher. Uh, is one right, one left, or they both? Um, um, they played opposite of each other. I think Rain Man could play either side. He's still new to the tackle position. Obviously, he's twenty four years old, but he's a former tight end, so he's got potential at either side. Interesting. Um, Godek is either going to play right tackle or he's going to play guard, in my opinion. Gotcha. So yeah, two great tackle prospects right there. Uh, as we keep scrolling down the board, I don't really have any other guy that necessarily stands out to me. I think this is a very good list. And again, I'm going to plug it in the description below. So make sure to check that out. Uh, and Rohit and I will be going over some of these guys tomorrow, talking about it to the Niners in the next segment, I should say. But you have anything else you wanted to talk about? Any other player you want to mention? Um, I'm sure there's one more shout out I'd love to give in here for for a favorite player of mine. Um Keep scrolling down uh, this know, side. Yeah, you know what? You know what? Um, I'm going to talk about Ty Chandler just for a second. Um, James Cook has been sliding down my board. I don't think he's a thumb back. I think Ty Chandler can be. He might move up a little bit more. I think he offers a similar receiving uh, factor to James Cook. Um, I think he, you can actually use him on runs. James Cook, he's going to be given six, seven attempts a game max, I think. So he's he's a third down back. I think Ty Chandler can be a a formidable RB2 on any team. So that's a guy I would look into. Yeah, definitely. I think overall, I, I think I think James Cook, I've seen him very high. And I think another reason he's been so high is because he's Dalvin Cook's brother and like he gets that buzz earlier on. Uh but well, Ty I, Chandler's I the a guy. Reason, I'm sorry. The reason you see him so high is because he's versatile. You can put him in the slot. Uh, you can have him run routes out of the backfield. He's a very, very polished receiver. Um, yeah. I just don't think he's a great runner. So I he might be sliding down my board a little bit. I feel that, definitely. But I think Ty Chandler, I mean, UNC produced two great running backs this year. Can they do that again? We shall see. Um, any other guy you want to look at really quickly before we cut uh, this off? Is there any anything, anyone that pops out to you? Any Any Niners guys? I mean, I kind of talked about them. We had Christian Watson, and we're going to talk a lot more about them in the next segment. Um, Obviously, I think Majai Sanders is one guy that's popped me out as an edge. I think we talked – Rohan and I talked about this last week about how it's deep. The Niners team is deep, that edge, but there's no star player. So I don't know if we're going to draft someone. I think we would draft someone earlier. Majai Sanders could be a guy – Right Sanders there, as is, Sanders could be a second, third round guy. Um, mm-hmm. I see a Same lot of unique in Gakwe. Alone. See a lot of unique in Gakwe and Sanders. Um, I just I don't know. Uh, it might take a, a minute, a couple years actually, for him to 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 reach that potential. Absolutely. Now, where will these players fall? Well, we're going to do some mock drafts next week, get some more guests on. It's going to be an even longer episode. Should be a lot of fun. You guys will not want to miss out. So stay tuned for next week. But in the description will be Zach's big board. Make sure to check that out. Coming up, we're talking about some of these guys on our 49er segment. Rohit and I will give you some guys to talk about, give you some guys to look at. You guys will not want to miss out. We're so close to the draft. So stay tuned. Welcome back. Episode 12 of the Corker Cap, the final segment talking about the San Francisco 49ers. We just talked NFL draft as a whole. Now we're moving on to NFL draft centered around the 49ers. I'm your host, Sam Corker. And Rohit, we're, we're less than 10 days away, man. How how, how hyped are you for this? I mean, I'm, I mean I'm, ex- I'm excited. I mean, draft time is always exciting because obviously you're going to see a lot of young guys get get an opportunity to, to pretty much realize what probably has been a childhood dream for them. 
But also, exactly. you get to a point where, for the Niners, again, I've probably said this point ad infinitum at this point, but I'll say it again. We're going into a new era, new quarterback, new basically offensive style, if we're being honest. Traylon's probably a completely different skill set from Garoppolo. That's not the point of this um, segment, but we're completely new everything. And so this draft will pretty much be the official start of that. We got a couple Absolutely. of pieces for that from the 2021 draft, but this is the really the draft that's going to say, "Hey, this is going to start the Trey Lance era." Absolutely, yeah. It's it, this is one of the biggest drafts. I mean, I, I we say it every year. This is the biggest draft in the recent era. I don't think it's as big as last year with the whole Lance thing, but you know, it's a pretty big draft. You got to get those guys late round, select those guys, and make sure to improve the team. But before we move to the draft, we got to talk about a signing that happened last week: Kamoko Ture, the Colts' pass rusher. Now a San Francisco 49er. Looking at his stats from last year, this guy is a uh, – he played 13 games last year. His rookie year was 2018. Had five and a half sacks last year. Uh, led the Colts with that. Only eight quarterback hits, though, so not many. His rookie year, had he had 13 QB hits. Uh, I know a lot of – Rohit, I know a lot of people have been saying that they're super excited about this guy. Uh, I, I would say I'm excited about him, but honestly, I'm not expecting too much from him. He could be the diamond in the rough signing, but overall, I think I would prefer a guy like Kerry Hyder over him. I think he fits the system a little bit better, uh, but I think this is a good signing to talk for uh, an, imp- an improvement on our D-line depth. Yeah, I mean, again, with the Niners, you just can't have more, you just can't have more um, defensive linemen. So what are we up to, like, around 11, maybe 12? So alignment? look at – I'll, I'll show you. This is a tweet I actually sent you earlier in the week, I remember. Uh, all right, so with the Kamoko Ture signing, um, if this loads – load, please. All right, whatever. Uh, yeah, with the Kamoko Ture signing, the 49ers have 14 defensive linemen in place under contract in 2022. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, those defensive linemen, I, I would say – I think I told, quoted this. Uh, I did quote this myself. What did I say? I said that it's a it's a deep defensive line. Armstead's good. You have Bosa, Armstead, Kinlaw. Those are the locks to make the roster. Everyone else I didn't mention has a chance of getting cut. And I think it's a deep defensive line. Like whoever doesn't get cut, I think will stand out for our team. But at the same time, there's not much star power. You really have Nick Bosa, Armstead. I wouldn't call him a star. Javon Kinlaw, we'll see what happens to him. I think losing DJ Jones was really rough for the 49ers. And I think if anything you have, you have Ebucom, Ridgeway, Givens, Hyder, Hurst, Omenahu, Willis, and uh, Kamoko Ture now. It, it, it's really up in the air to see who's going to step up. You don't really know. And that's really going to come down to training camp to see who's going to step up, who's not going to make this roster, and maybe who can be the diamond in the rough signing that the 49ers are looking for. Sorry about that. Um, You're good. But what's going to be interesting about this is like the fact that we have so many players. I think this is more so a quantity over quality type of thing. I mean, you have the headline talent in Bosa. Bosa is going to generate so much attention from opposing offenses that so many guys are going to go have an opportunity to get sacks. I mean, Arden Key had a career year. He turned that into a massive deal. Um, but again, I mean, Kerry Hyder had nine sacks with us in 20. 20- signing a big deal with Seattle, and now he's back with us. So, mm-hmm. And plus, it's Chris Kosurek. He's going to find a way. But Exactly. That's I what I'm saying. I didn't, but I don't think we need too much star power on that defensive line. We have we have our headline superstar. We have two high-quality players. And then we have a lot of depth. I mean, what more can you really ask for? Exactly. It's a good depth. I mean, this is something the 49ers do every year. They get a ton of depth. They They, they use it really well. Uh, so overall, yeah, I, I think it's a good defensive line. Uh, two more moves were actually just made. A little bit of breaking news coming on the show as we record. As I check Twitter right now, the 49ers have – or Daniel Brunskill and Jawan Jennings have signed their one-year tender. That was expected, so they'll be back on the team. Uh, uh, you get a good your, – your wide receiver three. You get your starting right guard. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. That's That's really all I have to say about that. Yeah, I mean – I think those mostly just expected moves. I don't think anyone was really going to make a move for either player. So it makes sense that they're back. Exactly, 100%. But now let's move on to the main topic of this discussion right here, this edition of the Corcoran Cap, the draft. 
And obviously, let me, let me go through our draft picks really quickly if I can pull them up. The 49ers, obviously, we trade our first round pick to Miami for the next two years. So our first pick will be at 61. After that, I believe we have two third round picks. If I look at it, so we have. 61, 93, 105, 134, 172, 187, 220, 221, and 262, which is Mr. Irrelevant. So Mr. Irrelevant will probably be a 49er, which is going to be fun to say. A uh, little bit of probably probably going to be our most well-known draft pick going into the draft. Mr. Irrelevant for years to come, maybe. We'll see. I don't know. But, uh, Who yeah. Future Hall of Famer, Mr. Irrelevant. Mr. Irrelevant, future Hall of Famer. Ryan Suckup was a Mr. Irrelevant. Could we get someone like him? We shall see. But, uh, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine draft picks. Three on day, three on day two. None on none on day one. Six on day three. I like where we're sitting in the draft, Rohit. I think, y- yeah, you would prefer a first round pick, but thing is, like guys are always going to fall to you at sixty one, who you have as first round talents. That's just how it works in the draft. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But yeah, I think overall, I I like where we're sitting right here. You got. Two thirds is really nice, and I think looking at this board, I, I, I the positions we need, I think you could say edge. I don't really know about that. I think defensive tackle maybe at this point could be a better position depending on where you want to play Eric Armstead. Uh, corner, I corner is interesting. Corner, you have Charvarius Ward, you have Emmanuel Mosley, you have Ambry Thomas. It, it, it's interesting to see what they want to do at corner this year. Uh, I feel like. I, I think you could be looking at one of the biggest needs, linebacker, or safety for that matter. And I, I don't know, really know why linebacker. I think safety makes a bit more sense than I think of it. But like overall, it, it, this this is a very deep 49ers team, and you're not going to need much. You could just be going with the best player available strategy. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, objectively, there aren't too many holes to fill. I mean, we're mostly just looking for some depth. I mean... Yes, defensive back is a concern, but again, there's plenty of time. I still feel like something could happen. If we if we were going to make a concerted effort anywhere, I'd expect it to be defensive back. Other than that, I just expect depth pieces or potential rising stars. Yeah, totally. And I think one defensive back I want to highlight um, is Marcus Jones out of Houston. A lot of people have been talking about this guy, and he is one of the best cornerbacks in this draft. I think he would be a first-round pick if he wasn't 5'8". Good slot cornerback. If the Niners, I think that's the one big question mark for the 49ers is slot cornerback. You have Traverius Ward as your X. Your Y is probably going to be Emmanuel Mosley. Slot, is it going to be Ambry Thomas or is it going to be um or is it going to be someone else? You even could put uh put uh Ambry Thomas as your cornerback too. And Marcus Jones could be a phenomenal addition. You could get him day three, day two, maybe late day two, too. Does it, I think the the size thing is really throwing some teams off. So overall, I think that would be a great guy for the 49ers to target at quarterback. I love his film that I've watched. I haven't watched too much film for, for really anyone, but I think overall he's a very solid quarterback. The other guy I want to talk about is um the other guy I want to talk about is uh Darion Kendrick from Georgia. Uh I, I he's a pretty solid cornerback in my opinion. I know you're not a Georgia guy, Rohith, but from what I've seen, he really kind of he was one of their better cornerbacks on that team, and I think he could definitely provide a lot for the 49ers coming in from day one. Yeah, another guy I'd like to point out is um, Mario Goodrich out of Clemson. And for one fact one fact alone, he did allow a single touchdown all season in 2021. Yeah, he's a good player. And I mean, and he could be like, but was he the true cornerback? Well, here's the thing. The fact of the matter is, if you're on the field and you're playing a decent amount of snaps, the fact that you didn't give up any touchdowns, that itself is impressive. That either that and here's the, I haven't really watched too much film, but that tells me a couple of things. You're probably either a sure tackler, or you just don't let them get big plays, or you stop plays before they start to form. Yeah, definitely. Also, I what think... I'm just trying to say is you got nose for the football. And that's yeah, no, any guys with an any guy with a nose for the football is phenomenal for a 49ers defense led by D'Amico Ryans. And D'Amico Ryans has a ton of guys on that team that have a nose for the football. So I'll take it. Also, sticking to the secondary, I want to talk about safety. I know there's been a lot of hype about some guys. Uh one guy in particular that I've seen a lot of late steam coming out for. And I guess he's visited with the 49ers today. Jaquan Brisker out of Penn State. A lot of people have been hyping uh, I, this guy. Uh, up. I was gonna go there too. 
Yeah, you know, I, I just want I'm uh, we can talk about him for a little bit, but a lot of guys have a lot of people have been hyping this up. I've seen his name thrown out a lot. And I wh- who's the other guy of AM that a lot of Niners fans are talking about? Uh AM. What what his name is, I've seen a lot of people like start to be down on him now. I think like I, I think from what I've I've been seeing, like I, I think a lot of people are attracting are being more attracted to Brisker. Um and other safeties across the class if they want a safety. And, y- you know, I-, I-, I don't know if I would say I'm on board with that yet. I think the other guy, uh, it's Leon O'Neal out of a and uh, I mean, he's a decent player. I think I think Brisker, uh, Brisker is better. But overall, I think Leon O'Neal will be a fine pick at 64 or even later in the draft. Yeah, that works for me. I mean, another name I see a lot of people trying to pop up is Nick Cross out of Maryland. Yes, but he honestly isn't that impressive to me. Like, interesting. He tested fine, but you—I mean, you watch you watch him play, and it's like, oh boy, it's like there's something there. Like, you, there's a lot. There's obviously just talent you can work, but it's like, is he truly a day one plug and play? Because at this point, given how little moves we've made in terms of like starting safety across from Jimmy Ward. You're probably looking at some sort of plug and play starting safety. And yeah, I just definitely. don't have faith that Nick Cross would be that type of plug and play starting safety. I feel I can see that. I don't think he's gonna be a day one guy. I mean, he's you're probably looking at a third, fourth rounder with him. So he may not be a day one guy there. And I think that's something you're probably gonna get with a lot of people in the secondary. You've seen it in like years past. A lot of guys don't get it going day one. So I think that's something you have to be aware of with the secondary, but yeah, I'm glad but we're in like agreement. That it's like that's one of those things where it's like you kind of want to get that short up pretty quickly, or else it may turn into a big detriment in the long run, especially as the season progresses. Yeah, absolutely. You're gonna need those guys to really step it up soon, especially when you're on a win now team. I mean, I I I, I don't know what we're doing with free agency at safety. Um, obviously, Tart still is, is still out there. You got some other guys out there that you could sign. So I guess we'll have to see what happens with that. But I think you got you got a target of safety in the draft at some Absolutely. point. Absolutely. At minimum, at least one. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's give one more prospect that you and I both like. I'm going to move it over to uh, – let's move it over to offense. And I'm going to go with Ty Chandler, the running back from UNC. Uh, I've seen him mocked all over the place, but I think this guy is, abs- is – like he, he's really like a workhorse guy. And I think – if you want to run first offense, like I think he would be a very good fit here, similar to Elijah Mitchell. If you want another guy, uh, Zach and I were just talking about Ty Chandler. We were talking about James Cook as well. Uh, James Cook is definitely a pass catcher, not really of a runner. So I think you could go with either of those guys uh, at running back. I think that would be a great pick for us. Yeah, I mean, I mean, since we picked Trey Sermon last year, the James Cook pick might end up being redundant. But I was going to say. But honestly, it's like it's one of those things where it's like, if you're gonna get to a point where the draft basically becomes best player available, take a flyer, take a shot, see what happens. Agreed. Yeah, I, I totally get that as well. So oh, one guy I want to talk about on us offense, but I'm just switching positions real quick. Calvin Austin the third, wide receiver out of Memphis. Memphis, yes. He's a shorter guy at five eight, but he can move. Oh, he like, can. This dude is quick. And I'm thinking. I mean, we kind of got Ray Ray McLeod, and who can who's pretty quick himself. But I'm like, but you see, but you see, um, Calvin Austin the third move, and I'm just like, imagine we can get that speed on the Niners. Oh yeah, no, you can't have too much speed at wide receiver. Yeah, I'll say that right now. Get, I mean, get him in open space, and just see what happens. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's going to be a fun draft. There's a ton of guys out there. You, you know, Rohith, we're nine days away from this frenzy. So, are you hyped? I know I am. I'm excited. <laughs> you got to be hyped. It's draft season, baby. Let's go. But that is going to do it for episode 12 of the Cork and Cat. Make sure to follow me on Twitter. Write down here, here at the underscore Sam Corcoran. Follow all the guys on Twitter at RohithCanon71, at ZCope3, at JoelPettit10. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.